Now, if you visited our website, uh, you know we've put lots of information there about making the case for God's existence from science and philosophy, about making the case for the reliability of Scripture based on a cold case detective approach toward uh, the actual Gospels. And this particular article that I posted years ago, uh, well, maybe about a year and a half ago, uh, really has been the most visited article at our website by a long measure. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, if I check my uh, statistics and the activity at the website at any given time, there's always somebody, two, three, four people uh, reading this article. And we're going to be talking about it because I think it's of interest to both skeptics and uh, believers who wonder, is there any uh, evidence for Christianity outside of the Bible? Is there any evidence for uh, the existence of Jesus outside the Bible. So I've got everything staged here. If you should see my uh, desk. It's filled with computer monitor screens, uh, all of which have contained information. We're going to try today to go through the uh, evidence for Jesus outside of the Bible from ancient sources uh, as a way to kind of make a case for the historicity of Jesus. But before I do that, and we're going to do it in two different groups, uh, both uh, uh, unfriendly, uh, pagan, uh, either Greek or, or Roman or Syrian uh, sources. And then we'll also do it from unfriendly Jewish sources, which are kind of in a separate category. So we'll do that today. But before I start, I want to talk about a couple of issues that I think are raised by even asking this question. When someone asks you, is there any evidence for Jesus outside of Scripture? If you really stop and think about it, they, they, that question wouldn't even be asked if they took the Gospels as serious historical accounts. Clearly, when someone says, yeah, you know, that's great that I see what you know, it says in the Gospels and in the New Testament about Jesus, but do you have anything outside of Scripture? Well, what they're really saying is, I don't trust that your Scripture is accurate, and I don't trust that it can even be called history in any way. And, and that's what we're going to talk about today. I think that, realistically, that's why I wrote Cold Case Christianity, was in an effort to say, well, why would we think that this is not reliable eyewitness testimony? Why would we think that these accounts don't include the accurate observations of people who actually knew Jesus? And I, I think if you're saying, well, I can only accept uh, versions of the Jesus story, uh, written by those people who were not friends of Jesus, that's a silly approach to take. I've talked about it in the past here on this show. I've talked about it in my public speaking engagements. But the reality of it is, is that the people who knew Jesus best, who could give us the kind of intimate details that are available to us in the New Testament Gospels, they became part of the inner circle of Jesus. And in the end, they became Christians, Christ followers, based on what they saw Jesus do for all those years. And, and then they wrote an account. So, for example, you might say, well, you know, I don't trust that the Gospel of John is reliable because, you know, John was a disciple of John the Baptist and he was kind of a friend of the movement and at least in the sense of kind of expecting the coming Messiah that John the Baptist for. Okay, fine. Let's kick him out then. And I don't trust, you know, that, that uh, you know, Peter giving the account to Mark, which is now in Mark's Gospel, he was kind of like John, you know, a disciple of John. The, okay, fine. But what do you do with Matthew? Matthew's a guy who was named Levi, who was a tax collector, who was no friend of the Christian movement, really no friend of anybody. As a matter of fact, most people who, who knew him did not like him, given his, his occupation as a tax collector. And Jesus finds him, not as part of the discipleship of John the Baptist, or not a part of any friend group, and he brings him into the fold. And after three years of watching what Jesus did, Matthew became a believer and then wrote an account. But he doesn't start off trying, you know, in other words, to say that this is, in many ways, you could argue this is an unfriendly account, at least initially. This is not somebody who was a friend of Jesus. He became a believer of Jesus based on what he saw. And it's very different to argue that something, somebody's writing something based on some pre-existing bias or simply just based on what they saw that then turned them into a believer. So the problem we have with the ancient accounts is all of those folks, whether they were initially friends of Christianity or not, uh, uh, initially were expecting the coming Messiah based on what John the Baptist had told them, or otherwise, anyone who knew Jesus well enough to write an account ended up becoming, now you might say, well, boy, uh, I wish that the Gospel of Judas was actually, act. you know, there is a Gospel of Judas, it's just a very late, um, you know, it's not a true uh, gospel. It's written very late by people who didn't even know much about the, the, the truth of Jesus, other than what they had read in the reliable gospels. And so, but he would be the one person, I guess you could say, Judas, if he had actually written an account before hanging himself. 
He would be the one person you could say, well, this is no friend of Jesus, uh, but he did write a story about Jesus. Well, it turns out his story is included in the Gospel of Matthew. And the reality is that Matthew was uh, just a stranger to Jesus who became a follower, wrote an account because of what? He saw. So the first thing I want to uh, clarify is that most of the time, when I'm asked for evidence for Jesus outside of the Gospels, what they're really saying is I don't trust the Gospels. And I would say, okay, fine. Then let's put the Gospels to the test. That four-part template that I often use with eyewitnesses, that's what I did to decide if I could trust what the Gospels said. But even if you didn't have the Gospels, even if you didn't have a single Christian document of the Church Fathers or anybody else, and all you had were the earliest statements of non-believers, you would know an awful lot about Jesus. And this is why even ardent skeptics like uh, Bart Ehrman, who rejects uh, Christianity, he still would argue, though, for the historicity of Jesus, that he was a real person who lived based on the kind of evidence we're going to talk about today. One last thing. We're going to use accounts that are as close to the life of Jesus as possible. But you might notice that some of these are, all of these are obviously after the, the resurrection, after the crucifixion, after the death and resurrection of Jesus. So you might say, well, I, I can't, I'm looking for something that's so ancient, it, 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 it co-dates, it, it um, coexisted with the Gospels, or it, it uh, was part of the earliest um, stories of Jesus. A couple of things about that. First of all, the Gospels themselves were not written immediately. They were written as the disciples realized they were going to be dying and not uh, being able to transfer the story orally. And now these Gospels began to get, to get written. So we have a gap of time before we have the accounts that are in the Scripture. But in addition to that, if you were to ask me today, if I was to do a show talking about the history of Abraham Lincoln, and I was to, to tell you all the stories about Abraham, and then a thousand years from now, you discovered this little video, and you had no other information about, about um, Abraham Lincoln. You didn't have the sources that I am referencing, the sources that I am thinking about as I'm telling you about Abraham Lincoln. You might be inclined to say, well, then I can't believe in Abraham Lincoln because I only have the word of Jim Wallace 150 years after the man was dead. But clearly, I'm close enough to the action to be able to source back the information to Abraham Lincoln and determine that the story of Abraham Lincoln is historically reliable. Now, I will tell you about it being only 150 years separated from it, not even that far separated from people who actually wrote about Abraham Lincoln, who died later on. Some of them died in the early 20th century. So these sources describing Abraham Lincoln are still apparently available to me. Now, when I discover an ancient account say it's Greek or it's Roman, and it's following the life of Jesus by 30, 40, 50, let's say even 100 years. We need to give it the same kind of consideration you would give my statement about Abraham Lincoln, given that I apparently have access to resources that I am referring to, and I'm speaking to you today in 2015, as, a, as somebody who is committed to the story of Abraham Lincoln as though it's historically reliable because I happen to still have access to the sources that demonstrate for me that it's historically reliable. And even if you don't have what I had in order to determine the reliability of Abraham Lincoln, you ought to listen to my story and give it some weight. Now, we're going to do the same thing with early stories in the first century, second century, about uh, Jesus. And although they may follow the story of Jesus for some period of time, the people who were not Christians who wrote about Jesus apparently were determined and were committed to the fact that Jesus really lived because they wrote about him as though he did really live. And like me, with my uh, connection to Abraham Lincoln, they had some connection to sources about Jesus. And that's where we will begin our study. Let's take a look at what unfriendly sources, in other words, non-believers, would say about Jesus. And that's what we're going to do. And we're going to start with an ancient Greek historian of the name of Thallus. Thallus was somebody who uh, wrote, and I'm going to be referring to my, um, my notes here as I go along. But by the way, this article in its entirety is called, Is There Any Evidence for Jesus Outside the Bible? And you can find it by simply looking on, uh, use a search engine, the search bar at coldcasechristianity.com. Okay, that being said, we're looking at Thallus here. He is a, a non-Christian source. His, his source is pretty uh, ancient, and uh, we don't have a lot of Thallus, we don't have anything really from Thallus originally. What we have are uh, 
pieces, fragments of the work of Thallus that are delivered to us by other ancient sources. Uh, I don't think there's any reason, though, to, just to, to not believe that these are authentic quotes from Thallus, because most of those sources that are quoting Thallus are not friendly to Thallus. And they're quoting Thallus in order to argue about what he's said. If you were going to try to pull the wool over my eyes, you would simply lie about what Thallus said and, and make him agree with you. But if you're going to embarrassingly uh, write about his disagreement with you, I think there's probably a good reason to believe that he actually did disagree with you. And so we have an ancient source from Julius Africanus in which he's going to quote something that Thallus writes about very early in history. You can see dating here right around uh, the... Um, uh, 50s, uh, 60s of uh, the first century. And here's what he writes. Uh, again, he is writing about uh, Jesus. He's also writing about a specific uh, a passage, a specific event related to Jesus, the crucifixion and the darkness and the earthquake that occurred at the crucifixion. Let's take a look at what he has to say. I've got it here on the screen for you. On the whole world there pressed a most fierce, fearful darkness, as is at the point of the crucifixion, and the rocks were rent by an earthquake, and many places in Judea and other districts were thrown down. This darkness, Thallus, this is Julius Africanus now, describing to Thallus in the third book of his history, calls, as it appears to me without reason, an eclipse of the sun. So Julius Africanus is arguing that Thallus, when writing about this darkness that occurred at the uh, crucifixion, is attributing it to a, an eclipse of the sun. An eclipse of the sun. Now that's interesting because what you have to do in order, you might say, well look, I, this doesn't tell us much. It doesn't. But it tells us that in the earliest source here from Thallus, that Thallus believed that Jesus was in fact a historical character who was crucified. And at the point of his crucifixion, there was a great darkness and earthquake, but the darkness was caused by an eclipse of the sun. He may explain it a different way, but he has to reluctantly back into several details, including the, the life of Jesus, the crucifixion, and the darkness at the crucifixion in order to make any claim against Jesus. So you get some data from this early non-Christian source. Let's go to another one. This is Cornelius Tacitus. Uh, Tacitus is, as I've, and I've written a lot about Tacitus on the website on this page. Um, he is basically um, wrote an, uh, the annals uh, for uh, Emperor Vespasian. And Vespasian wanted to know a little bit of detail about what happened under Nero's reign. So, so what you have here is a statement written by Tacitus, who is explaining in the annals he wrote, what uh, what what Nero uh, what Nero who Nero uh, blamed for the destruction of Rome? Let's take a look at what he writes here. Nero, uh, this is Tacitus writing. Consequently, to get rid of the report, Nero fastened the guilt and inflicted the most exquisite tortures on a class hated for their abominations, called what? called Christians by the populace. Christus, from whom the name had its origin, suffered the extreme penalty during the reign of Tiberius at the hands of one of our procreators, Pontius Pilatus. And a most mischievous superstition, thus checked for the moment, again broke out not only in Judea, the first source of the evil, but even in Rome, where all things hideous and shameful from every part of the world find their center and become popular. Sounds like Rome was a really hopping place at the time. Uh, but here's what this does tell us. It tells us that there is a group who followed a man named Christ, Christus, who called themselves Christians. Okay, makes sense. And that this man suffered the extreme penalty, was crucified under the reign of, of, of Tiberius at the hands of one of our procreators, who, guess who, Pontius Pilate, and that this mischievous superstition, what could that be? Hmm. It seems to me that what might be reasonable here is that there's a, a superstition related to the resurrection. Now, he's not going to say that here, but it does appear this is an early account that at least tangentially infers something about the resurrection, and we're pretty early in time. We're late 1st century, early 2nd century. Um, and this is the source of the evil was obviously here in Judea. Lots of details about location, about leadership, about government, about the way he was executed, about the names of his followers. Lots, even the hinting at the resurrection here, just from this uh, brief, non-Christian, hostile, unfriendly, uh, ancient source. 
So we know some things about Jesus now. If we lost everything else, we'd know some details now, wouldn't we, about who Jesus is. Let's go to another source. We're going to go to a Syrian philosopher named Marabar Serapion. And what uh, Serapion does is he's uh, writing to his son, uh, describing to his son the fate of a number of philosophers. He's writing you know, in the late first century, early second century. And he's writing about um, what happened to several leaders of several movements. Let's read what he has to say. What benefit did the Athenians obtain by putting Socrates to death? Famine and plague came upon them as judgment for their crime. Or the people of Samos for burning Pythagoras. In one moment their country was covered with sand. Or the Jews by murdering their wise king. After that their kingdom was abolished. God rightly avenged these men. The wise king lived on in the teachings he enacted. So here we have Jesus described without a name, as the wise king. He was, uh, in fact, that's what um, was the label that was put over his cross. Uh, the wise king of the Jews who was killed and then um, the, 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 uh, the kingdom was, the temple was destroyed in 70 AD. And then on top of it all, uh, there is some sense here that the teaching of this wise king continued on with his followers. Some more data we have related to Jesus coming from non-Christian pagan sources. Um, Hostile sources, that's what the most important part is. Let's go to Flagon. Uh, let me uh, scroll down here on my, on my uh, article on the website. Um, this is somebody who uh, is very similar to Thallus in the sense that we don't have the original work of Phlegon. We have to trust another ancient source to get what Phlegon said. And typically the ancient source that's quoting Phlegon is kind of debating it with Phlegon. So that's why I think that there's some credibility to what the ancient source is saying. If you're writing to a group that doesn't know who the sources are, you might as well have this guy agree with you. But instead, he simply says it as it is. Phlegon offers a position that is somehow different than the other ancient source. So he's going to mention this ancient uh, historian. is going to mention something about Jesus. We'll talk about it here on the screen. I've got a couple of quotes. Now, there's a lot more that I could add to this. And on the website, there's just a ton of, of, of really more information we're just not going to be able to cover here in 28 minutes. So uh, please visit that article if you want to learn more. But let's just talk about a couple of quotes from Phlegon being quoted by Origen. Now, Phlegon, in the 13th or 14th book, I think, of his Chronicles, uh, not only ascribed to Jesus a knowledge of future events, but also testified that the result corresponded to his predictions. So here you have somebody in the ancient world, uh, relatively early, late 1st century, early 2nd century, who is saying that, hey, this guy, Jesus, he also was a predictor of future events, and these things actually turn out the way he predicted them. Interesting. Now, also, you have this quote, Jesus, while alive, was of no assistance to himself, but that he arose after death and exhibited the marks of his punishment and showed how his hands had been pierced by nails. Now, remember, this is not an eyewitness who saw this. I'm not making that claim that any of these ancient sources that we're talking about today are, in fact, eyewitnesses. That's what's in the Gospels. And if you're wondering... Well, I can't trust the Gospels. You're not being fair to the Gospels because you haven't even tested them by tossing them out the way you have. You need to be able to test them. That's what cold case Christianity does. But the point here is that these are ancient sources who, if nothing else, affirm for us the information about Jesus that's already circulating. It's already circulating in the culture. It's what's being said about Jesus, much the same way I might report today about what has been said about Abraham Lincoln. So this is what you're hearing in the earliest sources. So here you have more data. His accurate ability to predict the future, the fact that he rose after the dead and exhibited the uh, uh, marks of his hands. Not all that unusual if you put this together with the Tacitus remark about this mischievous superstition. You start to see some parallels here. Let's do uh, another one, Pliny, uh, Pliny the Younger, uh, who is, his real name is much more complicated. I actually wanted to pull it up for you here. Gaius Plinius Cecilius Secundus. And he was uh, a lawyer, an author, a magistrate. He was somebody who uh, was uh, very well uh, known by leadership in the Roman Empire. As a matter of fact, he writes a letter to Trajan, uh, Emperor Trajan, in which he describes uh, certain aspects of Christian followers. Now, this is later in history. We're now looking at much a little bit later in history than the other sources in the sense that this, well, at least this, his information is more about followers of Jesus and their religious community than anything else. But when you see what he says about the followers and their religious community, you get a chance to mine out some data about Jesus. Check it out. 
But he says, they, the Christians, were in the habit of meeting on a certain fixed day before it was light. And when they sang in alternate verses a hymn to Christ as to a God, and bound themselves by a solemn oath not to any wicked deeds, but never to commit any fraud, theft, or adultery, never to falsify their word, nor deny a trust when they should be called upon to deliver it up, after which it was their custom to separate and then reassemble to partake of food, but food not of an ordinary kind and an innocent kind, because there were other groups out there uh, that were not necessarily partaking of, of food of an innocent or ordinary kind. Pliny is basically saying, hey, the Christians were, this supper they would have together. Now, what you see here are certain early beliefs that Christians held, if nothing else. Uh, you, is Jesus God? Did the earliest Christians think Jesus was God? It seems like he thinks they do. Uh, Pliny seems to report that. Um, also, you've got uh, questions about how they represented certain teachings of their master. If you're wondering about the historical reliability, for example, the Sermon on the Mount, or any of the moral ethical teaching of Jesus, you see some of it reflected here in the work of Pliny, describing what the Christians believed. So you've got some more data about Jesus. A very early historian commissioned to do a history of the Jews, and uh, a lot more detail about that online and in my book, Cold Case Christianity. I'm going to show you a stripped version, which I think is a reliable version of the most ancient non-Christian record in Judaism about Jesus, written by Josephus in his history. And here's what it says. Around this time lived Jesus, a wise man, for he's a worker of amazing deeds and was a teacher of people who gladly accept the truth. He went over both many Jews and many Greeks. Pilate, when he heard him, accused by leading uh, men among us, uh, condemned him to the cross. But those who had first loved him did not cease doing so. To this day, the tribe of Christians named after him has not disappeared. Now, there are many uh, kind of corrupted versions of the Josephus account. This account has been stripped of the corruption. And here you see that certain attributes of Jesus are once again affirmed. His miraculous deeds, the fact he was crucified under Pilate, the fact that the Jews led him to that crucifixion, the fact that his believers continued even though he was, um, he was crucified. Uh, if you were to go back and reconstruct the story of Jesus, not using scripture or not using church fathers, not using anyone who's a Christian, just using the most ancient records we have. Now, I'm going to include some details here from a couple of accounts I couldn't get to in 28 minutes that are on the website. This is what you would know about Jesus from the absolute bare minimum from this is just the non-Christian accounts. You're going to get a lot of information about Jesus from non-Christians early. Here's what it says. Jesus, we would know, from just the non-Christians in early history, was a real man who lived in history. He was reportedly born of a virgin. He had an earthly father who was a carpenter. He lived in Judea, in the region known as Palestine. He was wise. He was righteous. His teaching was so influential that he developed a large following of Jewish and Gentile followers. He taught his disciples to live with the same virtue that he exhibited, and his moral code was exceedingly high. But he was more than just a moral teacher. He possessed magical powers and had the ability to accurately predict the future. His supernatural acts and teachings persuaded many Jews to walk away from their Jewish beliefs. Jesus claimed to be God, and his disciples readily accepted that claim. The Jewish leadership ultimately brought charges against Jesus based on his actions and his teaching, and Pontius Pilate, during the reign of Tiberius Caesar, uh, crucified and prosecuted him. There was an earthquake and darkness at the point of the execution, and his followers, Jesus' followers, reported seeing him resurrected after the crucifixion, three days afterwards. And however, Jesus and even Jesus showed him, showed them his his wounds. Now, not only that, his believers believed that the resurrection was a was um, a proof that Jesus was in fact the Messiah, and they adopted his moral teaching. They lived their lives accordingly. They they held. Uh, uh, their belief in his deity. They held firm to that, even though it meant they were going to suffer under the Roman rule. As a matter of fact, they were persecuted for their faith in Christ. All of that information, all of that history of Jesus and his followers, you would know if you never opened your Bible. You can get that from non-Christian sources in the first and early second century. That's pretty powerful. A lot more to be said about this, and I'm afraid we're running out of time. But you can find out more at the website, Cold Case Christianity. Just scroll down. There are articles. Search, use the search engine there for evidence for Jesus outside the Scriptures. I've also written quite a bit about this in the book, Cold Case Christianity. Wow, we covered a lot of information today, and I hope it was helpful to you.